Chapter 2 Siebrecht Inside, the Reichsguard citadel was no less formidable. Unlike out in the city, where the houses and shops had grown tall haphazardly, as each occupant had tried to outdo his neighbor, the home of the Reichsguard order was commanding by design. Each building locked firmly into the next, and each corner the novices turned revealed another imposing sight. Monuments and memorials were crammed in every courtyard, and statues of the heroes of the empire stood at guard beside every entrance. The walls were decorated with the heraldry of the multitude of noble families who had served, and once their service was done, had poured money into their old order. Greater even than these were the Grand Hall of the Order, and the Chapel of the Warrior Sigmar, and, greater still, at the citadel's heart soared the tower of the chapter house of the Order of the Reichsguard itself. Emblazoned on each side with the skull, the wreath, and the cross of the Order, watching over its warriors and the city beyond. Siebrecht von Matz tried hard not to be impressed and failed. Less impressive, though, were Zebrecht's fellow novices. The interfering horseman, Delmar, had pointedly ignored Zebrecht after they had entered the citadel, and Zebrecht had returned the favor. Reichlanders, Zebrecht muttered. He swore that their pride was more precious to them than their lives. Zebrecht was sure of his aim. He was the best damn shot of any he knew in Nuln, and there had been no danger. No, if only that Reichlander Delmar had not overreacted, all would have been well. The crippled knight who had come to meet them, Brother Vereker, had forgone comment at seeing them about to draw on one another. Instead, he had merely bid them follow him inside, and led them to a side court, where the rest of the novices were assembled. No sooner had the three of them arrived, than half the novices gathered around and greeted Delmar boisterously. They shook his hand and slapped his back, and loudly congratulated each other for their privilege of joining the hallowed ranks of the order. Reichlanders, Zebrecht muttered again, shaking his head. He could recognize them with ease. They all had the same close-cropped hair and simple but well-cut clothes in the military style that was the current outdoor fashion. So slavishly did they follow the fashion that Zebrecht did not know how they could tell each other apart. He had known that a greater proportion of his fellow novices would hail from the imperial city and its surroundings. Reichland prided itself of having more of its sons in the service of the emperor than any other province. There was no service more convenient for the offspring of the Altdorf aristocracy than a knightly order established within their very walls, and there was no order more prestigious for the status-obsessed nobles than the personal guard of the emperor. So Siebrecht should not have been surprised that once the novices were all together, fully half of them were Reichlanders, and had ostentatiously gathered in a tight-knit group to the exclusion of the rest. Zebrecht instead regarded the remaining novices, those left standing at the fringes of the Reichlander huddle. The provincials, as the Reichlanders were already referring to them. None of them were speaking. Instead, they eyed each other warily. All of them were armed, and most kept their hands near their weapons. They had all come from quite a distance. One of them, who carried a small mallet as well as a sword, was an Ostermarker. Siebrecht could tell by the severe expression on his face, as much by the darker hue of his skin. The next was an Averlander, his clothes ribboned with the province's colors of yellow and black. Most recognizable of all was a Nordlander, who stood half a head taller than even the burly Middlelander beside him. He carried not one, but three heavy blades at his belt, and had a round shield strapped to his back. So these, then, were to be his companions. Siebrecht sighed. 
savages and inbreds from every backwater the Empire possessed. It had been too much to hope that he might see another from Nuln, anyone he might know already. As he searched around, though, one of the other provincials stood out, for he was regarding the Reichlanders with exactly the same contempt that Siebrecht himself felt. A good enough place to start. Siebrecht watched him for a moment as the novice shifted his intense stare from the Reichlanders to the others. Siebrecht caught his eye, and the two warriors held each other's gaze for a moment. One of them would have to make the first move, and in such situations, Siebrecht prided himself that the first move would always be his. He crossed the distance between them. Unlike the rest, this novice's attire was more restrained, and did not scream his origins as the other novices had. But as Zebrecht stuck out his hand, he noticed the golden glint of a small talisman around the other man's neck, shaped like a comet. Zebrecht von Matz. Zebrecht introduced himself. You are from Talapheim? he said with confidence. The Talapheim novice glanced down at the preferred hand, and then looked back up at Zebrecht. If he had been put off by Zebrecht's hearty salutation, he didn't show it. That's right, the novice replied, gripping Zebrecht's hand with equal force. Gunther von Krieglitz. Krieglitz's eyes quickly flicked down Zebrecht's attire. How was your journey from Nald? Zebrecht flashed a smile. This Krieglitz was quick. Not long enough to this destination, he replied, then leaned in closer. After we're done here, I need to find a tavern and get a drink. You coming? Zebrecht waited, expressing an air of innate confidence he did not feel, while Krieglitz considered for a moment. These first encounters, the first alliances you formed within a new group, they marked you for the rest of your life. It dictated the friends you would make, the opportunities you would have, the kind of life that might be yours. All right, Krieglitz replied, but let's get the Nordlander along as well. Krieglitz took Zebrecht's shoulder and guided him toward the big Northerner. No one's gonna stop us with him beside us, Krieglitz concluded. Zebrecht smiled again. He liked the man already. Krieglitz in fact invited the rest of the provincials as well. It's the Reichsguard way, you know, everything in big regiments, he told Siebrecht, and the others, not wishing to be left with the Reichlanders, all agreed. Brother Vereker returned to show them where their belongings might be stored, apologizing as he hobbled along that the night commander had not also been available to greet them. Commander Sternberg, he explained, had just departed to join the order on the road to the north, as had Marshal Helborg himself. At that, one of the Reichlanders spoke up. If the Order are heading to war, then surely so should we. We've seen battle before. Oh, you may go as soon as you wish, Novice Falkenhayn, Vereker replied. But if you wish to go as one of the Reichsguard, then you will have to wait until you have proven yourself worthy of the Order first. Zebrecht warmed to Vereker. He was a crippled warrior whose only role now was to play nursemaid to arrogant novices, but he still had some steel to him. Falkenhayn stayed silent in a bad humor. Zebrecht took a moment to inspect the Reichlander. Falkenhayn. Zebrecht knew it to be the name of a powerful family, and this novice obviously enjoyed that power. He had even trimmed his sideburns sharply across his cheek to resemble the markings of a bird of prey. Zebrecht noticed that the other Reichlanders were already looking to him as their leader, all except Delmar, who did not appear at home even among his own kind. Once the novices' belongings were stored, Vereker showed them to their sleeping quarters, and then left them to their own devices. 
As soon as he had gone, the Reichlanders left as a group to explore the citadel further. Zebrak nodded to Krieglitz, and the provincials went back to the White Gate, and brazenly strode out into the city. The Nordlander introduced himself as Theoderikson Gausser, and Siebrecht and Krieglitz realized that they had been joined by the grandson of the current Elector Count. Unlike Krieglitz, who was the eldest son of a younger branch of the noble family of Talabheim, and Siebrecht himself, whose own family had little influence in Nald's affair, Gausser's grandfather was one of the most powerful men in the Empire. Gausser himself was reluctant to speak of his connection, or much of anything else for that matter. Your grandfather is a great man, Zebrecht ventured. If by great, Zebrecht considered, one meant a rapacious land grabber for whom dominion over half the empire would be insufficient. Gausser merely grunted. Zebrecht eyed their surroundings carefully again. Altdorf was not short of publicans or taverns, but Zebrecht had instinctively guided the novices away from the finer establishments and towards the poorer quarter. The tavern he had decided upon was no den, but it was rough enough to have some life to it. It reminded him of the drinking spots that his band of bored noble sons had frequented back in Nald. In any case, Zebrecht reasoned, the swords the novices wore on their belts kept them safe from the casual violence of the tavern's other patrons. It was better than out on the street, where they had been assailed by legions of beggars, men and women, aged and young, whose desperation overruled their fear. Once they were seated, however, Zebrecht found easy banter between the novices in short supply. The Averlander, Alptraum, watched everything but had little to say of his own, and the Middenlander, Straber, and the Ostermarker, Bowden, had gone to the bar with some complaint about the liquor. Weishuber at least offered to buy the drinks, even if he did stare at everything as though he was a newborn. Are you sure we should have left? The wide-eyed Sterlander, Weishuber, piped up. No one said we could leave. No one said we had to stay either, Zebrecht replied. If you're so concerned, Weishuber, Krieglitz said, then head back now. Let's not be too nasty, Gunther, Zebrecht intervened. As long as our new friend wishes to enjoy the city, and has coin and a generous spirit, then he should stay. We will not be missed before the evening service. It is a wondrous city, Weishuber continued. I've never been to the capital before today. It is so alive. Zebrecht and Krieglitz shared a glance. Alive like a rat's nest. Zebrecht made a dismissive noise. It is nothing to null. You wish to see beauty, then see null, my friend. Do not forget, Nuln was the capital of the empire for more than a century before Altdorf. And Talabheim before that, Krieglitz said. Zebrecht raised a skeptical eyebrow at his fellow novice. In its own way, Krieglitz admitted. Talabheim is a great city, Zebrecht graciously conceded. It is strong. Gausser stated, That is good. Thick walls, Alptraum murmured, staring off through the window at the spires of Altdorf. But full of paper and lawyers. Krieglitz scowled. At least we have law. Is there any law in Averland these days? We have lawyers, Alptraum said. I saw a lawyer once. Only the one? It would have been more, but the rest of them escaped. The Averlander's strange comment hung over the table for a moment. Dolls, thief, Krieglitz said in disbelief. I would have never expected to meet someone like you here. Zebrecht chortled, spilling some of his wine. Krieglitz continued. 
nor one like you either, novice Mods. This time the touch of concern was clear in his voice. I tell you, my friend, Zebrak said, wiping the spilt wine from his face with his sleeve. I did not expect to meet me here either. I did not expect to see you here, old friend, Falkenhayn said to Delmar. How many years has it been? A fair few, Delmar replied. I could not come to the city. And I would never be seen in the country, Falkenhayn laughed and led the way on. He seemed quite familiar with the chapter house, and Delmar remembered that Falkenhayn's father had been a knight of the Reichsguard as well. Falkenhayn had showed them the Grand Hall first, which, as its name implied, was very grand indeed. Tables long enough to seat a hundred at a time stretched down its length. Stone arches crisscrossed its ceiling. Shafts of light shone through lined windows and warmed the rich, dark, oak-paneled walls. It was also currently very empty. Aside from the novices, there were scarce half a dozen knights taking their afternoon meal. Wait, my brothers, till we see it full with the whole order, Falkenhayn said to the others. It is a sight to be seen. Most of the knights who were present were accompanied by one of the order sergeants to aid them. Delmar was surprised to see them there, aiding the crippled, but apparently their duties extended far beyond merely protecting the chapter house's walls. The knights themselves had a great need of aid, for they had such a diverse range of injuries as to be more likely patients in Shalia's wards. They were clustered near the far end of the hall, close to the top table where places were always reserved for the Reich's Marshal and the Order's senior officers. Behind the top table was displayed the tapestry depicting Sigmar granting the land of the Empire to the tribal chieftains, who would become the first imperial counts. And above that were displayed the personal coats of arms of each of the Grand Masters of the Order who had served to date. Delmar saw Kurt Helborg's own heraldry in the eighth position along. At the opposite end, where the novices had filed in, there was another display of shields. These were far smaller, though, for there were dozens, hundreds of them. It was a wall of remembrance, Delmar realized, and there, a foot or so above his head, hung the shield of his father. Come on, brother, let's move on. Falkenhayn told Delmar in a hushed voice, and he started to lead him outside. Come on, Proctor, Falkenhayn said, louder, to the other Reichlander who had stayed behind, staring at the wall. Outside, Delmar released his breath. He was no stripling youth anymore. He had fought, killed, commanded others in battle. His father had gone from his life long ago, and Delmar had thought he had reconciled himself to that loss. Still, it felt strange to be walking those corridors that his father had walked, seeing the traces of his existence that still lingered here. The courtyard beyond the Grand Hall opened up into a wide expanse of empty ground. After seeing so many buildings crammed atop each other, Delmar was surprised to see open space left untouched. It is the practice field, Falkenhayn answered, where the novices train, the knights as well, when they are here. Falkenhayn's tone was tinged with disappointment that the order was on the march without them. The other Reichlander novices stretched their legs around the field. The day's events and the anticipation of the formal induction tomorrow had got their blood up, and they began to spar with one another. Watching with Falkenhayn from the side, Delmar saw how companionable the other novices were with each other. It seems you are all old friends already, he said. We are, Falkenhayn replied. We have all been serving in the Pistol Corps together this past year. 
Of course, Delmar said quietly. Proctor, dear, you remember Proctor, Falkenhayn continued, indicating the slightest of the novices. He and I enlisted together. Delmar nodded. Proctor's family and Falkenhayn's were related, and throughout their youth together he had ever been Falkenhayn's shadow. Harver and Bray were already there, Falkenhayn said, pointing out the two novices wrestling with each other. And Hardenberg came a few months later. You don't have any sisters, do you, Reinhard? I should keep them away from Hardenberg if you do. Delmar looked at the pleasant-faced young man as he adjudicated over the other novices' bout. No, no sisters or brothers. Ah, oh, Reinhardt, Falkenhayn said. Do not doubt that you have brothers now. Falkenhayn looked out to the other novices. Doesn't he, Falcons? The Reichlanders looked up from their sport. Falcons! they cried back. What's that? Delmar asked. Just a name the Pistol Corps called us. The others are quite fond of it. Falcons? Delmar said. After you? Falkenhayn shrugged. It is a shame you were not with us then. We could have used your strength. But come on, let us make up for lost time. Falkenhayn took him over to join the others. And let us hope that the war continues long enough for us to show the Empire's foes how the sons of Reichland fight. Zebrecht and the other provincials made their way, slowly but steadily, back to the chapter house. Zebrecht and Krieglitz walked side by side. Bodan and Straber supported each other, Alptraum walked on his own, and Gosser carried the unconscious Weishuber over his shoulders. The wine had insulated Zebrecht nicely against the cool night, and the human squalor in the streets around him. He was far happier now he was on the other side of the cup. He found himself singing an old nursery song, written as a learning rhyme to teach common children the provinces of the empire. As Zebrecht recited the first line, Krieglitz and Gausser, Strangers from across the empire, who had never met before that day, joined in and sang together. A voice from a window above gave the novices a short, sharp critique of their abilities as minstrels. Zebrecht responded by launching into the second verse with all the greater gusto. Krieglitz very firmly clamped his hand over Zebrecht's mouth. Be quiet, you idiot. You'll get us into even more trouble. Zebrecht flailed, but could not slip from the Talabheimer's grip. Talabak? One of the beggar women rose from the gutter and stumbled towards Krieglitz. You are from Talabak land? What of it? Krieglitz said, pushing Zebrecht away and moving his hand to his sword. The beggar woman saw the movement and cowered away. Nothing, noble lord. I did not mean any harm. Be generous and spare your fellow countrymen. Krieglitz let his sword drop back. You would have been better to stay at home. Our homes were burned, noble lord. The beastkin in the forests. Krieglitz grudgingly flicked her a coin, which she caught and hid instantly beneath her clothes. That is my last one. Do not send your friends after me looking for more. More trouble, Krieglitz muttered under his breath as he led the provincials on. You concern yourself too much, Zebrecht said, far more sober than he had been a few moments before. We will be fine. I doubt that indeed. I would wager it. What? Come, I shall prove it, Zebrecht retorted. A gold crown that we have not been missed. You are ridiculous, Zebrecht. Think of it as simple prudence, Gunther. Would you pay a crown to guarantee there was no trouble? Perhaps, 
Griglitz admitted. Then if we are not, you have your money's worth, and if we are, you have another crown to console you for your loss. It is prudent, I would say. Are you Talibheimers not known for your prudence? Krieglitz shook his head, but said, Very well. Done and done. Come on, Gausser, let us get the young Sterlander to bed. I cannot believe it, Zebrecht, Krieglitz said. You have got me gambling on my own career. Zebrecht laughed at his friend. And it is only the first day. Imagine what there will be tomorrow. Are you awake, novice Mots? Brother Veracker said gently. Zebrecht groggily cracked an eyelid. It was still dark. He closed it again. Good, Veracker said. Take him. Zebrecht was very much awake as the sergeants hurled him into the deep pool of black water beneath the chapter house. He gasped at the shock of the icy water and quickly surfaced. Then instinctively ducked again as the struggling forms of the other provincials were thrown in after him. All of them rose, spluttering protests. The only one who was still dry was Gausser, who was wrestling on the side with three sergeants trying to restrain him. One of them lost their grip, and Gausser picked him up and launched him bodily into the pool. The sergeants who had been handling the other novices glanced at each other, then threw themselves onto the struggling Nordlander. Enough! Veracker said, and the sergeants carefully loosened their grip. Novices, you will clean this pool. You will empty the water, scrub its walls, wash them clean, then refill it. Zebrecht's foot strained to reach the bottom, while keeping his head on the surface. He found he could stand, so long as he stayed on tiptoe. He tried to shout back at Veracker, but his breath still had not returned. Novice Gausser, Veracker continued, and the Nordlander shrugged himself free. You may leave with us, or you may stand with your brothers. It is your choice. Gausser stood for a moment beside the pool, then, staring at Veracker with bloody-minded defiance, he slowly lowered himself into the water. As I thought, Veracker concluded, we shall return when you are done, and here, something to help. Veracker dragged the bucket through the water and then held it up. Water poured out through its perforated base. You can't leave us. We could catch our deaths in here, Zebrecht finally managed to say. We have excellent healers, novice mods, Veracker replied, as he and the sergeants filed out. The sergeant Gausser had soaked, left with a pointed backwards glance. And if they should fail, Veracker continued, well, you shall not be the first. The cold remained in their bones for the rest of the day, and Zebrecht spent most of their induction around the chapter house, either shivering or yawning. He had expected the other provincials to attach a certain degree of blame to him regarding their unfortunate experience. Weishuber took it with equanimity, though. Albtraum acted as though nothing had happened. Gausser accepted it with his usual impenetrable stoicism and Bodan and Straber thought it had been a great joke. Only Krieglitz appeared to hold a grudge. Zebrecht decided to shake him from it. That evening, once the novices were sent back to their quarters, he wandered over to him and flicked him a gold coin. Krieglitz caught it sullenly. You really do not care, do you? That I do not. And Zebrecht did not. The Reichsguard had been no choice of his. Throughout his childhood, his father, the old Baron, had done nothing but blame the Reichland emperors for all the woes in the world. He clutched his bitterness still, his one solace, as he blindly brought the Mott's family to its knees. 
he allowed candles to be lit only rarely, and he said he could not afford them. He detested any sounds of laughter or mirth, and so Zebrecht and his brothers and sisters crept around like mice. The Baron had turned the family home into the family grave. Of all of them, only the Baron's younger brother, Zebrecht's uncle, had escaped the poison of the household completely, and once he left, the Baron never allowed him back. The uncle had gone into the merchant trade, and would return once every few years, laden with gifts. Even then, Zebrecht's mother had to take him and his siblings to Nald to meet him, as the Baron refused to have his brother set foot upon his land. As he grew older, Zebrecht had also kept away as best he could, gaming, drinking, he and his friends had even joined the pistol corps when the war came, and they took what excitement they could from the tedious patrols and brief alarms. Zebrecht had hoped that they might stay together and join the city regiments. He would have cut a fine figure indeed in their black uniform, and the Countess of Null was renowned for her fondness for having young officers entertain her at her great dances. Instead, his family had sent him here, far from his friends and his ambitions, to protect the life of the very man they had raised him to detest. So no, he did not care. Understand me, Zebrecht, Krieglitz said, with deliberate import. This may not be important to you, but it is to me, to my family. So I will be your comrade, I will be your friend but I will not let you be my undoing. Agreed? Agreed, Zebrecht said, and they shook hands on it. I will not be your undoing, Gunther. I would wager a crown upon it. Of course you would. Krieglitz shook his head. Veracur called the novices to the practice field, and had them stand in a loose semicircle at a corner. They each wore their plain cloth tunics, and had been given a sword, a wooden waster. They were met there by several of the order's sergeants, and two of the Reichsguard's fightmasters. The first fightmaster stood formally at ease, his feet a shoulder width apart, his hands behind his back, or to be more precise, hand, singular, for the fightmaster's left arm ended no more than an inch below his elbow. Nevertheless, the knight held the arm at a perfect angle, as though his hands still grasped each other. The second knight stood a step directly behind him. Unlike the first, his face was downcast, his eyes were bandaged, and his head was completely bald, not a hair upon it, not on his scalp, nor above his eyes, nor on his chin. He had his hand on the shoulder of the fightmaster before him. Verrecker introduced his brother knights. This is brother Talhofer and brother Ott, Verrecker said, indicating the lead knight and then the second. While you are novices, you will not address them as such. Until you can prove yourselves worthy and become full brothers, you will address them as Fightmaster Talhofer and Fightmaster Ott, or simply as Master. Verrecker bowed to the Fightmasters deferentially and hobbled away. As the other novices turned their attention to the Fightmasters, Zebrecht, thoughtfully, watched Verrecker go. We are well met, noble sons, Fightmaster Talhofer declared. I see in you the burning need to serve the Empire and I can tell you now that the Empire has great need of that service. You will have heard already that before you may become a brother of this grand order, you must prove yourselves in three disciplines. Strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of spirit. Of these three, strength of body is most important, for without a strong body, you will never protect the Emperor from those who seek to do him harm. Strength of body is what you will learn from me. There was a shifting among the novices. Some of the provincials and the Reichlanders were not impressed. 
They were not children who needed to be taught basic drills. You have all served before, Talhofer continued. You have all fought. You all show promise, else you would have never been allowed here. Promise, though, is not enough. We do not entrust the life of our emperor to those who merely have promise. We entrust it only to those who have proven their ability. Not simply to fight, but to fight as a knight of the Reichsguard must. We will train you to fight, and we will test you. You may think you are a great warrior already, but if you cannot or will not learn what we have to teach, then there is no place for you here. Talhofer drew out the paws, waiting for one of the more prideful novices to speak, and knowing that none of them would. The novices stayed silent. We will teach you how to fight as the Reichsguard in every circumstance, on horse, on foot, in the crush of a regiment, in single combat, against one opponent or against many, for we must be prepared to serve in whatever manner the Emperor demands. Talhofer beckoned to one of the sergeants attending him, who passed him a halberd. You must become adept in all the arms of the Empire as well. Talhofer easily hefted the heavy weapon in a single grip. Skill with lance and sword are not sufficient. You must be ready to use whatever weapon is at hand. While you will spar with each other to learn and to practice, the purpose of your training is to fight the enemies of the Empire, not each other. Some of you, I warrant, have drawn your sword in anger against a comrade because of injury to your honor. That ends here. Duels of any kind between members of the Order are strictly forbidden. For we are a brotherhood, and from this point on, you must be brothers to each other. Zebrecht stole a glance in the direction of Delmar, but he and the rest of the Reichlanders merely looked on. Now I shall call each one of you up in turn to judge what you have learned already, or rather how much work I will have to do to undo the bad habits that poor teaching has already instilled within you. He told the novices to sit, and then called Harver forwards. Zebrecht had expected that Talhofer himself would spar, but instead one of the sergeants squared off against him. It was a surprise. The sergeants were all common-born, and while noblemen learned to use a sword from childhood, few commoners had the money or the time. In a few blows it was over, and Harver was flat on his back. Zebrecht dropped his pretense of uninterest and watched the bouts closely. He had been quietly confident, for in Nuln dueling was a constant pastime for his band of libertines. He had had to defend himself not only in single combat, but also in the sudden and deadly street fights that erupted between different bands over the important things in life, wagers, women, and honor. But these sergeants had been taught well. Novice after novice stepped up, and no matter what their past experience, each was defeated. Zebrecht allowed himself a small smile when Delmar had his sword knocked from his hand. Novice Mots, your turn to spar. Talhofer ordered, Let us see whether you Nulners are as eager with the sword as you are with your pistol. There was a stir among the Reichlanders. News of the clash between Delmar and Siebrecht on their first day had spread quickly among them. As Siebrecht rose, he whispered to Krieglitz, A crown of mine says I mark him. Siebrecht stood up and walked over with his typical swagger. He took his position and settled into his guard, ready for the sergeant to attack. Novices! Talhofer interrupted before the fight could begin. You did not tell me that the Reichsguard had accepted a Tylean. It took Zebrecht a moment to realize that the fightmaster was talking about him. I do not follow your meaning, master. I am no Tylean. 
If you are no Tylean, novice mods, then why do you stand like one? Confused, Zebrecht looked down at his feet. Take up a proper Imperial Guard, novice. We shall have none of those Tylean arts here. They are fit only for women. The other novices, realizing the Fightmaster's joke, laughed hugely. The Reichlanders especially. Embarrassed, Zebrecht shifted to a fair approximation of the Plow Guard that the sergeant had adopted, holding his sword at waist height, pointed at his opponent. Zebrecht cursed under his breath. All the dueling instructors of Nuln taught the Tylean style. There was no fault in it, and now he had allowed himself to be forced into a style in which he was less comfortable. Before Zebrecht could reconsider, the sergeant took the initiative and advanced, raising his sword into a roof guard, hilt by the shoulder, blade pointing straight up as he went. Anticipating the downward slash, Zebrecht gathered his blade in, and when the blow came, was ready to lift his own blade in reply. The sergeant's weapon crashed down upon his own with full force. Zebrecht felt his elbow give way, and grabbed his hilt with his free hand to prevent his guard collapsing. On the sidelines, he heard the fightmaster thud disapprovingly. Zebrecht had intended to beat the sergeant's sword away and twist his blade to respond with a cut of his own. But it was all he could do to keep his opponent from his neck. The sergeant drew back, preparing another strike, and Zebrecht took the opportunity to step quickly backwards, giving him a few precious seconds to recover. The sergeant advanced again, but this time it was Zebrecht who attacked him with a lightning thrust, not to his opponent's chest, but to his thigh. This was what true swordplay was about, Zebrecht knew. Not words, nor tricks, but simply being faster than any opposition, and in that he excelled. The sergeant corrected his strike, sweeping his blade down early to deflect Zebrecht's thrust away. Zebrecht was ready for it, and, just before the swords made contact, he flicked his wrist and brought the point over the sergeant's hilt and up against his chest. It was a move designed for lighter, slimmer weapons than this ungainly practice sword, and his wrist muscles protested at such treatment. But the sergeant was surprised, and had to throw his body back to evade the sword's tip. Zebrecht thrust forwards again to realize his advantage, but the sergeant found his feet and managed to stumble backwards, before finally knocking Zebrecht's sword away with a desperate swipe. There was another moment's pause as both sides reassessed the other. Zebrecht could tell that his fellow novices had been impressed. None of them had managed so much as trouble the sergeant, let alone drive him back. But he also knew that the sergeant had been too confident. He would not be caught out so readily next time. The sergeant, though, appeared to have learned nothing from the last engagement, and once more advanced with a high guard, exactly as he had done the first time. It was obviously a trap. Evidently the sergeant hoped for Zebrecht to draw his sword in again, ready to block, and allow him a chance to close the distance perhaps even reverse his guard into a downwards thrust. Zebrecht did the opposite and threw himself forwards, thrusting straight at the sergeant's chest this time, trusting to his sheer speed to succeed without any tricks. As Zebrecht moved, the sergeant leaped forwards, keeping his sword high, but twisting to evade the novice's point. Zebrecht's blade slipped past the sergeant's side, and so he hurriedly stepped back to pull away. Too late. The sergeant's free arm slammed down, pinning Zebrecht's blade between his arm and his chest. Desperate, Zebrecht tried to twist the weapon to cut its way clear, but the sergeant had already snaked his arm around Zebrecht's sword hand and locked the elbow. Dropping his own sword, the sergeant gripped Zebrecht's shoulder and dropped his weight dragging the novice down with him. They both hit the ground, 
but the sergeant landed on top, and still with his grip. In mere moments, Zebrecht was face down with the sergeant's knee in the small of his back. At an order from Talhofer, the sergeant released the lock on his arm, and the pressure of the sergeant's knee lifted. Feeling humiliated, Zebrecht clambered to his feet. You still have your sword in your hand at least, novice Mods, though you would find it of little use where you were. Aware of the mocking stares of the other novices, who were enjoying his defeat, Zebrecht did not say what he wished, and instead muttered something under his breath. What was that, novice Mods? Ah, curse them, Zebrecht thought. He had a legitimate grievance. I thought this was sword sparring, master, not wrestling. If he had known that he would have to defend himself from wrestling moves as well, he would have not been taken off guard. Talhofer considered the novice from Nuln. Did I ever say that this was sword sparring, novice mods? No, he hadn't, Zebrecht recalled. They had all simply assumed. No, master, he admitted. Was it simply because you were given a sword that you thought a sword was the only weapon with which you could fight? Seabrecht did not speak, but gave a half nod. Though it is true you will learn sword from me, and wrestling from Master Ott, we draw no distinction between them in combat. We fight with the whole of our body, novice mods, every resource at our disposal. 